Coming up on Arirang News, South Korea's economic growth in the third quarter comes in at 0.4%. That's in line with the government's forecast, but there's also the problem of falling prices. President Moon Jae-in says South Korea will continue to work with its neighbors, China and Japan, to reduce the fine dust pollution that plagues all three countries. Korean lawmakers, too, the president says, need to help by passing laws on the issue. And the U.S. raises the pressure on South Korea to pay more for its defense, with talks on the issue to be held this week. Seoul insists that any cost-sharing deal has to be fair to both sides. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thanks for tuning in to Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. South Korea and the U.S. are holding another round of negotiations this week on sharing the cost of stationing American troops on the Korean Peninsula. Ahead of those talks, the top U.S. diplomat for East Asia has ramped up pressure on Seoul to contribute more. But South Korea says the burden should be fair. Kim Minji reports. David Stilwell, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, has upped pressure on South Korea to contribute more to defense costs, stressing Seoul's capability has grown exponentially in recent decades. Speaking at a seminar in Washington on Monday, Stilwell added that he sees opportunities for further cooperation and the ability to use their capabilities in a cooperative way. His comments come as South Korea and the U.S. are set to hold a fresh round of negotiations on sharing the cost of stationing American troops on the Korean Peninsula in Washington on Tuesday and Wednesday. He noted President Trump's remarks, saying as the security background changes and as Washington's partners become wealthier and more capable of taking care of their own security, they have to invest in that as a show of alignment. However, Seoul is adamant that the cost-sharing burden be fair and reasonable. Arriving in Washington, South Korea's top negotiator highlighted that they can strike a win-win deal based on the common understanding of the alliance they share. There must be a reasonable and fair burden-sharing agreement. The most important principle ultimately is that the negotiations contribute to the alliance and strengthen our combined defense posture. Chang also reaffirmed the figure must be within the framework of their cost-sharing agreement, under which Seoul shares the cost for Korean civilians hired by the U.S. forces Korea, the construction of military facilities and other forms of support. The previous round of talks held in Seoul two weeks ago were cut short, with both sides unable to narrow their differences. South Korea said the U.S. demanded a massive hike, while Washington said Seoul wasn't responsive to its requests. The U.S. is believed to be demanding that Seoul pay five billion U.S. dollars annually, a more than five-fold increase from what Seoul agreed to pay under the current deal that expires at the end of December. Asked if the South Korean team had come up with new proposals, Jung said they have various alternatives without elaborating. He added the allies have been in close communication on the issue since the last round of talks in mid-November. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. In a rare move, the U.S. has deployed tactical spy aircraft over the Korean peninsula six times in the past week, amid reports that North Korea is getting ready to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles, considered a red line for the U.S. Kim Ji-un reports. U.S. reconnaissance planes have flown over the Korean peninsula at least six times in the past week, raising speculation that the U.S. is putting pressure on North Korea as a year's end deadline for denuclearization talks draws near. According to aircraft spots, the U.S. deployed the E-8C joint stars on Tuesday morning, the same jet it deployed over the peninsula when North Korea launched two projectiles from a super-large multiple rocket launcher last Thursday, the 13th round of major weapons tests the regime has conducted so far this year. The Joint STARS has the ability to detect, track and hand off targeting information on moving enemy forces on ground, which is considered one of the U.S. military's most important technological capabilities. Two days after the projectile launch last Saturday, the U.S. deployed the U-2S, the so-called Dragon Lady, which can identify objects as small as 10 centimeters from a distance of 100 kilometers. In the process, the U.S. military exposed the verification code of the Dragon Lady, which some local media outlets in South Korea saw as a deliberate move to pressure the North. This comes after multiple reports that the regime has installed scores of concrete bedrocks across the country to support its transporter erector launchers, prompting speculation North Korea is getting ready to fire intercontinental ballistic missiles if there is no progress on denuclearization talks by the year's end. Kim Ji-yeon. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un yesterday celebrated the building of a new town that officials there are hailing as a symbol of economic and social development. Kim has visited the town three times, in fact, to show that the regime can get by even under sanctions. Oh Jung-hee reports. North Korea has finished constructing the township of Samjian County, and it held a ribbon-cutting ceremony on Monday, attended by the regime's leader, Kim Jong-un. The North State-run Korean Central News Agency reported Tuesday that the township of Samjian County has transformed into, quote, the epitome of a socialist modern city. Several top North Korean officials joined Kim Jong-un at the ceremony. Choi ryong viewed as the regime's second-in-command, gave a speech stressing the completion of the township shows the regime's potential for independent development and proves its self-reliance capability. The event was to celebrate the North's completion of the second stage of Samjian County construction process. Pyongyang aims to complete the third and final stage next year when it celebrates the 75th anniversary of the establishment of its ruling party. Kim's visit to the town in Samjian County is his third so far this year. The North Korean leader has put great emphasis on building the county not only as a means to modernize the North's rural economy, but to also to show off the regime's ability to survive despite the weight of crushing international sanctions. Samjian County is also home to Mount Pekdu, the mountain that Kim Jong-un visits whenever he has to mull over grand policy changes or make big political and economic decisions. This latest visit comes as the year-end deadline North Korea has set on nuclear negotiations with the U.S. is drawing near. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. South Korea has expressed deep regret after Japan once again refused to acknowledge its use of Koreans for forced labor during its colonial rule. Seoul's foreign ministry said Tuesday that Tokyo's latest report on the conservation of its Meiji Industrial Revolution sites has not changed much from the last edition in 2017, which said the industrial projects at the sites were supported by Korean nationals. This goes against Japan's pledge after repeated requests from Seoul to address the forced labor issue. South Korea has been raising the issue of the forced labor sites since 2015, when they were listed as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Japan also refused Seoul's request in 2018 to engage in dialogue on the matter. Tottenham Hotspur's South Korean forward Son Hung Min has been named the Asian Football Confederation's International Player of the Year. Son edged out Japanese and Iranian players to pick up the award for the third time, having won in 2015 and 2017. South Korea's Lee Gang In, who received the Golden Ball as the best player of the recent U-20 World Cup, won AFC Youth Player of the Year. Chung Jung Yong, the former head coach of South Korea's U-20 national team, was named AFC Coach of the Year. Non-Korean citizens have a chance this week to be given a Korean name by the city of Seoul as a way of promoting the beauty and excellence of the Korean language, Hangul. Any foreigner can apply on the city's English website until December 7th by submitting a Korea-related personal story. The city will then choose 10 people and give them Korean names, which will be delivered via email. The Seoul Metropolitan Government first ran the contest to commemorate Hangul Day in October. The Bank of Korea has released growth figures for the domestic economy in the third quarter, and the overall GDP figure is on par with the bank's earlier estimate in October. Still, it's a little lower than the quarter before. Kim hye sung reports. South Korea's economy grew 0.4 percent on quarter in the July to September period. That's the same as the Bank of Korea's preliminary estimate announced in October and lower than the 1 percent growth tallied in the second quarter. The central bank said construction investment was revised down while consumption and exports were revised up. Construction investment contracted 6 percent due to a slump in building construction. Private consumption edged up 0.2 percent on higher spending on durable goods. Government spending increased 1.4 percent on health care-related expenditures. Exports jumped over 4 percent on quarter thanks to increases in semiconductor and auto shipments. GDP deflator, which measures the change in price for all goods and services, dropped 1.6 percent on year, falling for the fourth consecutive quarters 
and marking its biggest fall in two decades. The Bank of Korea attributed the sharp fall to lower consumer demand and export prices, which slumped nearly 7 percent due to tumbling chip and petrochemical goods prices. We are seeing low inflation as the economy loses vitality and consumer demand remains sluggish. If GDP deflator is low, people's nominal income will drop. Nominal GDP grew just 0.4 percent on year in the third quarter, meaning people's income will go down. Continuously low inflation could lead to a contracting economy. Real gross national income rose 0.6 percent on quarter. The BOK says to reach its growth target of 2 percent for this year, the local economy has to expand by more than 0.93 percent in the last quarter. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in says South Korea will continue to work with China and Japan to combat the region's chronic fine dust pollution. He also explained a set of measures to be implemented in winter when fine dust concentrations are especially high, calling for legal support from parliament. Our Park Hee-jun has more. A higher level of cooperation with neighboring countries to combat fine dust pollution. President Moon Jae-in says a coordinated response to the problem has become possible after joint research between Korea, China and Japan showed that each country has contributed to the air pollution. President Moon held a luncheon on Tuesday with the National Council on Climate and Air Quality to discuss pan-national solutions to fine dust. The council is a presidential committee in charge of tackling the fine dust problem, chaired by former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The president thanked the council for its ideas and support for the designation of September 7th as the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. Adopted by the United Nations last month, it will help the international community to jointly seek solutions to air pollution. Adopted by the United Nations last month, it will help the international community to jointly seek solutions to air pollution. He also asked for the committee's continued support for the P4G summit on green growth hosted by Seoul next June, so that it may serve as a platform for active discussions on climate change and air pollution. On a more local level, President Moon introduced a system to manage seasonal fine dust during a cabinet meeting the same day. Effective between December and March, the season with the highest concentrations of fine dust in Korea, the measures include limiting the use of grade 5 emission vehicles, mostly diesel cars. And in public agencies, the government will also ban cars with unnumbered license plates from driving on even-numbered days and vice versa. These measures will begin in Seoul, Incheon and Gyeonggi-do province before later being applied nationwide. But all of this, he says, needs to be backed by parliament. And President Moon called on the public to actively participate, but he emphasized that it's to ensure the health of all Korean people. Park Hee-jun, News. Time now for an in-depth look at the market news this afternoon. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Mr. Daniel Yu, global strategist at Uanta Securities. Mr. Yu, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me today. Well, uh, now we have another factor in global stocks, and that's uh, Trump announcing new tariffs on steel and aluminum from Brazil and Argentina. That and some disappointing numbers for U.S. manufacturing. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, with the, those kind of news, the U.S. market has shown quite a bit of a decline yesterday. The Dow was down 0.96 percent, the S&P 500 was down 0.86 percent, Nasdaq was down over 1.1 percent. Um, as you said, the U.S. President Donald Trump said that on Monday uh, that he will immediately restore tariffs on U.S. steels and aluminum imports from Brazil and Argentina. Uh, in terms of why he's doing that is because he's saying that these two countries have uh, massively divided their currencies, and which is not good for uh, U.S. farmers. Uh, and because of that, they are, uh, the U.S. is putting tariffs on steels and aluminum. Uh, well, if, I mean, if, 
that is kind of a bit of a overstating the fact uh, that the Brazil economy was growing at only 1% this year. Uh, and as you know, the Argentina is faced with a massive uh, currency devaluation due to the IMF bailout process. Uh, that economy was actually shrinking in terms of the growth. Uh, so um, the level of the the uh, the tariff that it was put on, I'm not sure whether that is actually uh, uh, going to be a long-lasting factor. Uh, probably what. Uh, and Trump wants is, is that the currency to uh, appreciate for the Brazil uh, uh, rear and also the uh, Argentina uh, pesos because the currency wise it has depreciated well over 30 percent for uh, for Brazil and also for Argentina as you know that the devaluation has been quite significant. Um, so we will see some of the things that will happen, and we think that we need to find the, the actual attractiveness of the, uh, the South American countries where the current uh, currency-wise, I think that the, a lot of these companies are making huge profits. And also in terms of the PMI numbers, uh, yes, the U.S. ISM PMI numbers came in at below expectation, and it still remains to be below 50. But as for the IHS market manufacturing PMI numbers, it was showing a very significant recovery, and it showed 52.6 in November. So it's kind of mixed signals, and we don't think that U.S. economy is going to go to a possible recession in the future in any time soon. Uh, I think that a lot of these things are actually coming out as a political measure rather than at actual economic numbers. So uh, we need to watch and see how this plays out. But it might only cause the temporary uh, volatility of the equity market rather than creating a massive decline in terms of the prices. Got it. Well, the decline in stocks uh, went beyond Wall Street uh, here in Korea, continuing the decline we've been on since last week uh, and in the region, too. What's the story in, around uh, the East Asian markets? Yes, as you said, Kospi was down 0.38 percent and also the Kostak was down 0.78 percent. And Korea continues to be a underperformer of global equity market in the last several weeks. Um, as you know, that the, the changes in the MSCI index uh, for the emerging market resulting into Korea's net selling versus net buying of China is affecting the underperformance of the Korean equity market. Uh, as for the other Asian market, as you said, uh, the, the effect is not necessarily for all the Asian countries. Uh, if you look at the uh, China, there is uncertainties, but nevertheless, we have seen today a uh, slight recovery coming through uh, as the Shanghai index was up about 0.3 percent and the uh, Shenzhen index is up about 0.5 percent. Uh, so we think that the, the Chinese economy is also fairly stable uh, with the, some of the numbers that are coming out yesterday on the PMI numbers on both uh, manufacturing and service sector. Uh, and both of the numbers were coming in well above 50, which means is that the economy is expanding a bit. So, which is saying that uh, the issues are individually different. Uh, the Korea probably faced with a very weak growth rate uh, and continuation of concern regarding the investment cycle. Uh, we think that the Korea is faced with a lower growth rate than the, the intrinsic growth rate. So, uh, that is the issue. Uh, but as for the overall Asian market, and, and including China, we think that the overall market seems to be fairly reasonably okay, and that the performance of the Chinese equity market should continue in the future. Well, Mr. Yu, we've got about one minute left, but uh, we got this figure out called the GDP deflator, which is at its lowest in 20 years. A lot of concerns about low growth and low inflation. Explain that figure and uh, what the situation is. Yes, as you said, it is low growth, uh, low inflation uh, indicator. So clearly there's a concern about the labor uh, changes, uh, whereas the, the birth rates are lowest and the long-term growth rate potential is lowest. But I think that the biggest reasons why these deflation, deflation uh, things are happening is because the actual investment cycle seems to be in negative territories, and that continues. Uh, we need more aggressive boosting measures, including rate cut, as well as the fiscal uh, policy measures. Uh, without that, we will see continuous um, lower growth rates than expected. 
All right, Mr. Yu, we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Now, French products, including wine and cheese, could face 100% tariffs as the U.S. confronts France over its taxes on American tech companies. President Trump also vowed to restore tariffs on steel from Brazil and Argentina. Om ji has more. The U.S. government has announced it may slap tariffs of up to 100 percent on some French imports in retaliation for a French digital tax. In a report on Monday local time, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer recommended punitive tariffs on 63 product lines with the import value of around U.S. $2.4 billion on French goods. Lighthizer said that the tariffs are justified because of France's digital services tax imposed on U.S. technology companies including Google, Facebook, Apple and Amazon. The Trump administration has been looking into the French digital tax for months and has concluded that it is inconsistent with prevailing principles of international tax policy and is unusually burdensome for affected U.S. companies. In July, France passed the digital bill that levies a 3 percent annual tax on big tech companies that provide services in the country. President Trump is scheduled to meet with French President Emmanuel Macron in London on Tuesday on the sidelines of a NATO leaders' meeting. Meanwhile, President Trump also said on Monday that the U.S. will restore tariffs on steel from Brazil and Argentina. Brazil has really discounted. If you take a look at what's happened with their currency, they've devalued their currency very substantially by 10 percent. He justified the move by saying that devalued currencies harmed U.S. farmers by making it harder for them to export their goods. The Dow Jones fell 268 points or nearly 1 percent on Monday following concerns over global trade risks and news of fresh U.S. tariffs against Argentina and Brazil. Om Ji Young, Arirang News. It's been more than six months since the U.S. banned the Chinese tech firm Huawei from buying core components from America for use in its smartphones. With Huawei saying it can find new sources, the U.S. is pressuring European countries to cut off Huawei, too. Oh Young has more. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has warned the EU against working with Chinese network firms Huawei and ZTE, accusing them of spying on users and stealing personal data. Pompeo wrote a strongly worded op-ed for Politico Europe this week, as EU ministers gather in Brussels for a communications meeting. He said the Chinese IT giants have a track record of alleged espionage, theft of intellectual property and links to the Chinese military and intelligence services. Pompeo urged European leaders to rely on other companies such as Ericsson, Nokia and Samsung for their 5G infrastructure. He said those three companies offer high-quality network equipment at competitive prices. Amid the ongoing trade war between Washington and Beijing, the U.S. administration has banned Huawei from buying key U.S. components and software without special permits. These include the Android operating system as well as semiconductor design tools and radio frequency chips, which are a vital part of smartphones and are needed for the development of 5G devices. However, Huawei plans to continue expanding its range of handsets without American-made components. Huawei's head of corporate strategy said sourcing the hardware for smartphone manufacturing wouldn't be an issue due to the availability of alternatives on the global market. The Chinese telecom giant expects its smartphone shipments to hit 300 million units in 2020, up 20 percent from this year. Wu Xiang, Arirang News. A natural, natural gas pipeline has been laid connecting Siberia and China. The roughly 3,000-kilometer pipeline called Power of Siberia opened on Monday under a 30-year, 400 billion U.S. dollar deal to supply natural gas from Siberia to China, crossing China's coal-burning northeastern provinces. The pipeline will deliver 38 billion cubic meters of gas a year to China once it hits full capacity in 2025. The pipeline will make Russia one of the main suppliers of natural gas to China, bolstering ties between Moscow and Beijing amid China's trade war with the U.S.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.2016년 9월 28일, 부정 청탁 및 금품 등 수수의 금지에 관한 법률, 청탁금지법이 시행됩니다. 청탁금지법은 공직자 등의 공정한 직무 수행을 보장하고 